Welcome to the RFP Success Show with host Lisa Rehurik, the number one sought after authority on RFP success. Each week, we bring you information, strategies, or resources to help you win more business through RFPs and have a little fun doing it. Let's get this week's episode started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the RFP Success Show, where we connect you to strategies and resources to help you win more RFPs. I am your host, Lisa Rehurek, the number one sought-after authority on RFP success and passionate about helping small businesses win at business. So today, we have the wonderful, fabulous Tish Times. And Tish has actually been a guest of mine before on the live radio show, so thrilled to have her back again, talking about something a little bit different. So I'll get to that here in a minute. But what Tish is, is she's a sales and networking expert. She's also a speaker, a trainer, an author, and founder of Tish Times Networking and Sales. You know, when I first met her, she was all about networking, and that's how I know her. That's what we talked about on the live radio show. But she is this plethora of information, and networking is only one little small piece of it because she's really a sales gal. She knows sales inside and out. And she teaches small business owners, solo entrepreneurs, and sales professionals how to increase income with unparalleled sales and networking strategies. She's fantastic. She also has books, of course, no surprise. My favorite title, Networking is Not a One-Night Stand. I love that. That's, I think, her latest book. And it's a guide for building lasting business relationships. She also has the Unstoppable Confidence Networking Playbook and 10 Super Simple Networking Steps for Career Success. Tish also has something called the Unstoppable Confidence Sales Academy. And this is key, and I love the name of it because, you know, a lot of times one of our challenges with sales is the fact that we're not as confident as we should be. So she teaches you how to be confident with sales. And it's really a business school that teaches a systematic, sincere, and effective approach to networking and sales to produce lucrative bottom line results. In addition to that, and this is something that I'm so excited about, is that she's got a relatively new service. It's a done-for-you service to follow up on leads. Like if you go to a conference and you've got a whole stack of leads that you need to follow up on, her and her team will do that for you. And there's more to it than that. If we have time, we'll talk about that. But without further ado, Ms. Tish, welcome to the podcast now of the RFP Success Show. Woo-hoo, I am super excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what I just was about to say? Like, everybody needs some time with Tish. And <laughs> that's her name, Tish Times. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. It was a gift from my husband. <laughs> it was, right? Hello. And how many times have you heard that? I need a little bit of Tish time. <laughs> I use it. I use it a lot. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine what a great marketing thing. So well, here's what we're going to talk about today. Because last time you were here, we talked all about networking, which is such a huge part of sales. But what I want to talk about now, because in the whole RFP world, a lot of times people that are responding to RFPs aren't all just sales and business development people. And I want to talk about getting a business development mindset and what does that mean and talking a little bit about that in the context of not necessarily people that have chosen business development or sales to be their career, right? It's maybe not supernatural to them. So in your mind, what would you say business development mindset even means? So Lisa, I want to answer that by a little story. Yeah, I love stories. Yeah. Well, people automatically assume because of what I do that I chose it, that I was like, I'm going to go in for sales. That's the thing that I really want to do. And that's so not the case. When I was in the world of staffing, which was my first career, I was very content in my cubicle placing people in jobs all day long. You know what? I was a staffing coordinator. I loved it. I loved the type of work that I got an opportunity to do. And I had, I now say amazing. I thought she was purely the devil, to be honest with you, when I was <laughs> working there. But she was like on me all the time about, you know, moving into the sales department. And my whole thing was, I don't do sales. Sales is scary. I think it's slimy. I don't want to do it. And I resisted it for probably about maybe even two years. It was a long time. And there was just this mindset that, I couldn't ask someone for money, that I couldn't be successful Mm. going from, you know, this relationship 
type of person that I had become to switching into this salesperson that I had to be. And I kind of felt like it was two totally different things. And I think that's the issue with most people. Yeah. I found that I can still develop relationships. I could still, you know, really be myself and still be successful at sales. That's when everything shifted for me. So long answer to that question, but I really think that's what it is. Yeah, I agree with you because I'm in the same boat, right? You know, I've always said how much I hate sales and now I embrace it and I love it. But it does take that shift in understanding how we can find our own sales personality, for lack of a better term, right? So for people that are listening that are like, no, I hate sales. I don't want to deal with sales. What advice would you give them to say, okay, you got to find kind of your own way, like stop doing it the way other people teach you. Cause that was one of my problems, right? Somebody yeah. was teaching me a process. I was following a script and I hated it. Yeah. So how would you suggest our listeners figure out what their style is and how to embrace that? So I'm so glad you asked that because in my classes yesterday, you mentioned the Unstoppable Confident Sales Academy. One of the classes that I taught yesterday is what to say when you connect. And the question that kept coming up was, it feels weird. I don't like the scripts. And I said, okay, I want you to forget all of that. And no disrespect to any other sales training programs. I've looked at a lot of them. I've participated in some in years past, but I don't like to feel like I have to put on this hat that does not belong to me, that doesn't fit, that doesn't feel good. And I don't ever want to teach people to feel like, you know, we have a saying around here, it's called rock your shell. Because people will always say, get out of your shell. Yeah. (laughs) People always say, get out of your shell. I'm like, no, learn to rock your shell, meaning learn to operate within the parameters of who you are. And so when people realize that they really can be themselves, they can be authentic, they can also be very good at sales, it really shifts everything. So the question I always ask people is this. How do you love what you do? Do you love serving people? Do you love being able to see the light bulb come on when people are getting what you're trying to teach them or see the transformation that happens in them for their body, for their business, for their life? So if you'll consider it that way, I'm not selling people, I'm serving people. Now it's like you get that stigma out of the way and you're able to just do what you do in the way that you do it. Oh gosh, I love that so much. And it is so true. I believe that anybody can sell. Yeah. Right. Because we always say, oh, you've got to be a really outgoing personality to sell, or you've got to be really (laughs) extroverted and all of that. But don't you agree that anybody really can sell? Yeah. I mean, you know what? If you got kids, if you have ever had a boyfriend, girlfriend, I mean, you always are negotiating. You're always selling. That's true. (laughs) That's a really great point. We're always selling something at some point. Oh, I love that. So when we are talking about RFPs, because I know there's people listening that are like, well, I'm listening to this to talk about RFPs and what does that have to do with selling? Of course, an RFP is a sales tool. Um, We don't always have that opportunity to be face-to-face with these buyers, right? We're responding to an RFP in writing. How do you translate that into sales? That's kind of a big question, but... It is, but I think it's the same because we're always communicating, right? And if we're, we're getting paid for a position... We know that everything that we do, we're always representing the end goal, whether it is to secure the RFP, to, you know, to get buy-in in another way. So the same way I would send an email to you, Lisa, and we're just kind of communicating and I'm saying, hey, let's get together for lunch or, you know, I'd love if you would be willing to take a look at this with me. You know, there's not a huge shift. Maybe there's a little more formality to the conversation, but it's still very similar in that you don't go into this robotic you know, scripty type of communication just because it's written and just because it's an RFP. And again, we've talked about this. Oh I've my done gosh. This. I've yes. done this. This is not something I'm saying, okay, I read about it and I'm just going to tell you I've done it. I know. And I've been able to build relationships when that initial conversation was all behind, you know, an email or letters or those types of things. Yeah. And you know, for our listeners, something that you need to know about Tish too, is that she has a lot of RFP experience, like in her prior world, actually in her current world too, we were just talking about another RFP that you're bidding on. So, you know, she knows RFP, she understands what we're talking about here. And one of the stories that you told me, and I'm going to try to prompt you here because I'm putting you on the spot in the other show that you did with me was how you connected with people in the bidders conferences, that it wasn't just about showing up to the bidders conference. Can you talk Mm -hmm. to that a little bit? Because I think that's super powerful too. 
Yeah, for sure. And I think that, you know, the first part you just said as far as, okay, we're communicating and writing, it makes it more difficult. Well, it's not always the case, meaning, so I just completed a bid right now, right? And one of the first things it says is, bidder's conference is not mandatory. So the average person goes, whew, I don't have to worry about that. And they don't go. (laughs) They just say, okay, I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to deal with this face-to-face stuff. Well, quite the contrary. I think that that's the opportunity to take that, you know, written communication to a face-to-face and start to really build that relationship. So we are able to shake that person's hand, make sure that they know that we have the expertise that we've said we bring to the table, take every opportunity to begin building that relationship. So we have a few opportunities in the RFP world to really take it deeper, but often we miss them because we feel like we can hide behind our computers and hide behind (laughs) the fact that there's certain requirements. Yeah. And that's such a great point because I hear that all the time. And I know, you know, you and I've had this conversation. We hear all the time that like, well, once the RFP comes out, we don't have any contact. We can't have any contact. So A, that's true. So shame on you for not having been building the relationship, which is a whole other conversation that we can have. Right. But B, go to that bidders conference and show your face. And one of the things that you said, Tish, is you go to those bidders conferences and you make sure that you go up and you shake their hand and you look them in the eye and you make eye contact and you hand them your card so they know who you are. Because like how important is that for them then when they're reviewing the RFP, right? Right. You don't want to be just another name on their desk because that's what's happening. You know, easily, sometimes dozens, sometimes hundreds of people are handing in these same RFPs in that same brown envelope or whatever, yep. right? So you don't want to be just another name on their desk. You want them to pick up your form and say, oh yeah, I remember meeting this person, which also means, and this is probably a whole nother podcast, is that you have to learn how to communicate effectively in that in-person opportunity because yeah. you're not going to have a lot of time, right? You're not going to get a chance to talk to them in depth in most cases. So your engagement statement is what I call it, not an elevator pitch, but an engagement statement has to be powerful. It has to be memorable. You have yes. to make sure that they're going to remember you. They're not going to say, who was that Tish Times? They're going to go, yeah, I remember meeting her. There's yeah. got to be something that's going to make them remember you. And to that point, then you go into that RFP response already being known and people already have a hopefully positive impression of you and that's going to stick because, you know, back to the comment you made a little while ago that, you know, people get really dry and boring in these responses. I can't believe how I'm reviewing one right now and I'm just like, oh my gosh, people like add a little bit of pizzazz and personality and the reader wants to engage with you, right? It's no different really than in person. Let's say you're going to a networking event and you're connecting with a couple of people that you really want to connect with, potential clients, potential referral sources, whatever that is. What are a couple of things that you can do to make an immediate good impression when you first meet somebody in person? So some of these things work better depending on the scenario. For instance, if you're at maybe one of the bigger conferences, meeting some of the buyers, you might have more opportunity to do these things. Sometime at the bidders conference, you may not have as much time. So kind of understand that there's a place and a time for everything. But I always teach that the person who's asking the most powerful questions tends to be remembered. And I say that because, Mm -hmm. you know, I realize that If someone's coming to me, and I always give the example of an event that I put on, and the first team I worked with didn't ask me many questions. They came and they said, we're going to do this, 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 and this. I had never put on a conference. I was like, okay, Okay. sounds great. It It was mediocre. It wasn't as profitable as it needed to be. And I wasn't extremely pleased with the results. And then the next year, hiring a new event management team, the first thing that they did was ask me specific questions. The kind of questions that make you think, oh my God, I never even thought about that. This person knows what they're talking about, right? And so sometimes the questions, believe it or not, we think it's us telling everybody what I do. I do this, I'm great at this, I'm fantastic, I'm awesome, blah, blah, blah. Whereas if I'm asking the right questions, number one, I am actually showing my expertise. Number two, I'm gathering, I'm educating myself on what they really need and what they're really looking for. And so, yeah, being armed with, Great questions really is a thing that sets you apart from everyone else. Because everybody else, I guarantee you, is going, hi, my name is, mm-hmm. I do, I have, I can, ah, da, da, da. I, I, I always say you're part of the choir. Me, 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 me. It's not I about you. I love that, that you say. 
<laughs> but it's so true. And even in reading RFP responses, they still are all about them and it's different, right? It's harder to ask the question because there's nobody there to respond to it, but you got to get creative right. with it. And I agree wholeheartedly with you when you ask questions. I mean, it's interesting. And I think I told you this, I went to a conference recently and every single vendor that I talked to just spewed information at me constantly. Yes. And the only one person that asked me questions, I stayed there much longer and they're the only ones I remember. And they're the only ones that I really want to follow up with and use because yeah. they asked me questions. And that was, you guys, a whole room full of people that sell for a living and they were doing it poorly. I needed to be handing yeah. Tisha's cards out. <laughs> 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 right. So do you think that people are like that because they have the wrong or lack of training? Or why do you think that people approach sales in such a, I'm going to shove stuff down your throat instead of, like you said, let's ask more questions and get to it that way? Well, I think it's a combination of people who have not had training or have had training that is very traditional. I'm all about non-traditional because that's how we communicate, right? Yes. Um, but then the second thing is, the average person, when they get scared, when they get nervous, they just start rattling. So what about you? What about the weather? You know, you just start talking because at that point, reasoning isn't there. You're just trying to get through the moment. And many times that fear takes over and it yes. begins to communicate in a way that does not really show us in our best light. So being prepared helps us in some ways to overcome some of that fear. In many cases, people just don't do what I call their pregame routine, getting prepared for the networking event, getting prepared for those conversations so that you don't have that kind of, you know, fear chatter coming out that's just all about yourself because that's what you know best. <laughs> yeah. So what does that pre-plan, that pre-game plan look like? Well, you know, and this is maybe a shameless plug, but I'm just going to say it. My book, The Networking Playbook, it really runs through how do you prepare for an event? Meaning, you know, if there's any research that you could do, if you're doing these big conferences that have your supplier, you know, your buyers and things like that, you're going to be able to do some good research and find out who's going to be yeah. there and how long have they been with the organization and all this great stuff. So you go in much better prepared. You know who you want to identify, who you want to connect with. Additionally, you'll have some questions. Now, you're not going to read them. You're going to pull them out and be like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me read this. But you'll yeah, have don't to, do that. Right. You'll have two to three good questions in your mental arsenal to know what information you're trying to extract from those conversations. And then number three, you'll also be prepared with your engagement statement. What you're going to say that's going to make you stand out from all of the others in the room. And many times we just go in. We have no plan. We're just like, whatever happens, happens, opposed to these are the four people. I am not leaving until I have connected with these four people. You know, whatever else happens, you know, I'd love to shake everybody else's hand, but I'm on a mission to connect with these specific people because I've done the research. I know what they're looking for. I know that I can potentially meet their needs. And then it just changes your entire, I think, experience at those events. Yeah, there's so much that you just said there that is gold. Plug away for your books because the reason that those are so valuable is because you've got this great value and you're sharing that. We're only going to be on this you know, podcast for 30 minutes. So, you know, there's only so much we can share. I love the plug. And, you know, it's interesting when I think about, you know, sales and how that transfers into RFPs is that if you're going into an RFP cold and you haven't had any opportunity to ask questions up front, there's no way that you can sell in mm -hmm. the best light possible, whether you're doing this in a, like a person to person sales interaction, or you're doing this in an RFP, you've got to get that information up front. And I read a really great quote on Instagram this morning that, Oh, I'm going to forget it. Dang it. It is people buy based on what they need, not based on what you think they need. Right. And yeah. how much do we yeah. push that? We can maybe see it because we're the experts, right? But you got to meet them where they are. Yeah, for right. sure. No doubt. I mean, I've had situations, you know, especially back in the staffing world where, you know, you spend sometimes weeks selling this and you're like, we have this great receptionist. <laughs> They're going to be phenomenal for you. Da, 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 da. And you're like, yeah, but I needed that entry clerk. You know what I mean? So you're, oh, yes. you didn't ask the right questions. I could tell you story after story after story of how, you know, people on our team had wasted so much time selling this if they would have just asked one more question, they would have known that the client needed that plus this, or they needed something completely different. And often we do that and we miss opportunities because they're off on to the next person who is actually going to ask the right questions, find out what they need, yep. and be more concerned about them than just telling them what they can do. Yep. 
Yeah, and I love that you just said that. Just one more question, because just one little nugget, one little piece of information that you have over your competitors, because there's a lot of bad salespeople out there not asking questions. So that's a huge leg up, right? I love that. When we go back to kind of talking about sales and business development, and we might have covered this, but I want to ask this question very succinctly, is why do you think so many people are really afraid of sales? Like, what does that come down to? Well, number one, I think that it comes down to our misconception of what sales is, as I mentioned earlier, that it's just kind of like you feel like you're on the spot, you have to convert this person immediately, you know, there's so much in that, there's a lot of pressure there. But I think there's also that huge inner kid in us that still fears rejection, that, you know, it's like, if I'm just talking to you, and I'm giving you something you want, then you're going to like me. But the moment I ask you for something for myself, now, all of a sudden, you may not like me. And we have, again, a misconception that sales is about asking for them to give you something opposed to still providing for them what they need. And so we're able to get past that. That fear of rejection goes away. We recognize that we're in a partnership at that point to get to a mutual goal. The goal is for that person to achieve whatever goal that they desire. You know, when I'm working with someone and they come and hire me to teach them how to sell more effectively, my new goal is to help them to achieve that goal. Their goal is to be able to achieve that goal. So if we're in it together, there's no fear of you not liking me. There's just that desire for us to get there. And so I think when we are able to shift our mindset in that way, it does change our entire, I think, mindset around sales. Yeah, I think so too. And something else you said a little while ago about the old way that people were trained, right? Like the old school. Don't you think that that's just gone now? Like if people are still holding on to it, they need to get rid of it because we're in a whole new world of sales culture that is much more of that transparency, that relationship selling and no more of that, pardon my French, but that bullshit that used to be long ago. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Right. I think people are definitely on a search for authenticity and they recognize it when they see it. And I'll be honest with you, Lisa, one of the best compliments I get is that they can kind of resonate. It's not that kind of feeling like someone's trying to sell them something. It really is that authentic, this is who I am. If you're not able to handle who I am, then I'm probably not the best person to serve you type of, you know, kind of approach. I mean, if you're on any kind of social media, I guarantee you you get a private message at least once a week. And we've talked about this with that whole, you know, very old school, ineffective, you know, cold type of sales approach. And I know the average person for me, it turns me off instantly. And you're not going to get any further with me if you're doing that. So it's like, yeah, maybe it had its time. But that season is long since passed, I believe. Yeah, I believe so too. I want to shift just a little bit here. And a lot of what we're talking about is sales, embracing sales for yourself. But let's talk about like a bigger organization now, right? I believe, Mm -hmm. as I know you do as well, that everybody in the organization is on the business development team, right? Everybody has a place with yeah. helping the business development. How do we go about building a culture in our organizations to have more of that business development sales mindset? Well, I think it comes down to really making your organization a place where people are passionate, where they enjoy the work that they do. They enjoy the team that they're a part of because no one is going to be a evangelist for you if they don't enjoy what they do. If they don't feel Mm, like they're getting great benefit from it. So it starts with, you know, when you first hire someone, what is your hiring practice? How are you training your people? How are you making them feel valuable and really appreciated? Because all of those things lead to them being a part of the business development team. I've absolutely been in a room and you could probably say the same where you're talking about this particular product or service only to find out later that there was someone in the room who represented a company who sells that and they didn't say a word because they're not proud of that place. or they feel like, you know, oh yeah, you may want to go somewhere else. They're not what I call a brand evangelist for that organization. Whereas there's other places you may say, hey, I'm looking for a blah, blah, blah on Facebook before you can hit post. Someone's going, oh my God, my company, we do this, I can help you. And they are not a part of the management team. They're not an owner, but they love that organization. They feel like a valued member of that team. So, I mean, there is a place where people become brand evangelists, but it's not once you tell them that that's their job. It's, you know, when they start working for that organization, 
How are they being treated? Dave Ramsey has been voted the best place to work in Nashville, Tennessee for probably like five or six years in a row. Yes. Yes. But it's because of the processes that he has in place to make his team feel valued. And now they're brand evangelists because of the way he treats them. Yeah, this is such a great conversation because I do know organizations who say, all right, we need to implement more of a business development mindset, business development culture. And, you know, everybody needs to get on board with RFPs. That's how we get the majority of our work. So rah, rah, sis, boom, ba, right? Yeah. That's not going to work. And I love that. If we think about all of the cult following with businesses, those come from businesses that have that kind of an internal culture where their employees are the ones that are promoting it way more than anybody else. Yeah. So that's a really great point. It starts yeah, with the I, processes. I mean, and sometimes people think, well, I don't have Google money or I don't have infusion salt because right. some of these organizations, they, they have cereal bars and they have, you know, <laughs> sodas you can get all day and all this stuff for their people. But, you know, one of the things, and if you could see my core values for my company, one of the things that is a core value for us is that we treat the team like family. And that might be a team of two or a team of 10 or, you know, however yes. big we find ourselves getting. But you can start where you are and still make your team feel like they can take ownership in the position that they have. And so they will be your brand evangelist. But many companies, big and small, miss that. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, Infusionsoft and Google and all of those started with one person somewhere or two people somewhere anyway, right? I mean, we all grow into. So, and I would say for the small business owners that are listening, who's probably the majority of the people listening, you know, think about that and think about what kind of a culture you're breeding internally. And for you larger companies, that's going to be a much bigger hump to get over. But it does go to everybody needs to be on board and excited about what you offer. And they Mm. should all be using the product or the service or passionate about it in some way, shape or form or they're not going to be your brand evangelist. I like that terminology. So good. All right, Ms. <laughs> Tish, what is one key takeaway, if you could tell the listeners anything for them themselves to get into that business development mindset, what would you give them as the number one tip they need to do like now? Take a self-assessment as to what your blocks are, because often we just kind of assume we're just not good at sales. We're just not good at anything related to sales, whether it's filling out the RFP, doing the presentation yourself, or actually being in a true sales position. Yeah. But if we'll take a look at, okay, what possibly could be contributing to this mindset and then really assess that and then figure out a way to get past it. Like I said earlier, if you're able to determine, okay, I really love what I do. I just don't like this sales piece. Then yeah. forget about the sales piece. Just be the very best person who serves your clients. You know, now there may be a question you have to ask, you know, how quickly can I help you to make this change instead of, would you like to buy my stuff? You know, maybe it's terminology you can change, you know, that changes the entire experience for you and for the person who's buying. So think about what's going on up here. Most of the problem is not in our level of expertise, education, experience. It's all what's going on in our minds. Yep. And I agree. Total mindset shift. And the only way that you're going to get to that shell of who you are that you talked about earlier in the call is to figure out your mindset, right? Because you got to get that right before you can really embrace who you are and own that. Right. um, And own how you want to approach sales, right? Right. And so Lisa, I know you didn't ask for this and I didn't even think about it until you just said it. I have a free document that's called the Millionaire Sales Mindset Blueprint. Ooh, I love it. Yeah, I'm happy to give to anybody that would like it. I can send you the link and you could, you know, disperse it as you see fit or whatever. But it's a free document that kind of helps you remember these little things that can help you get your mindset around sales. Oh, I would love that. So send me the link. I will make sure to the listeners that this goes in the show notes. So you'll get that information in the show notes. Click on that. You can connect with Tish that way. Tish, how else can they connect with you? Well, my website is tishtimes.com and it's just like it sounds, T-I-S-H-T-I-M-E-S.com and everywhere on social media, except for my Facebook fan page. I'm just Tish Times. And on my Facebook fan page, I'm Coach Tish Times. Oh, nice. Yeah, you guys, she's got so much great information. She's also a contributor to the RFP Success Book. So you'll find her in there as well. And hopefully, I think she'll also be a contributor to the RFP Success Institute that's rolling out this fall. Um, So you'll be able to learn from her that way. So many different ways to connect with her. And you should definitely do that because she's a plethora of information 
all things networking, sales, business development, and just because we are RFPs and it's all written does not mean you don't need to embrace everything that Tish has to say. So make sure you keep that in mind. Thanks for listening. You all have been listening to the RFP Success Show with RFP expert Lisa Rehurick. We'd love for you to subscribe to our show on iTunes so you don't miss anything. And Tish, thank you for being here. It has been a pleasure as always. Thank you for having me. I love hanging out with you. Yes, you too. All right, everybody. See you next time. You have been listening to the RFP Success Show with RFP expert, Lisa Rehurik, author of the RFP Success Book. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, make sure you click the subscribe button so you don't miss a show. And thanks for spending time with us today.